All right, how's everybody doing today? Hotep, hey, this is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecture writer, and historian. So it is Monday, uh, July 12th, 2022, and we are live. I just wanted to come on for a few minutes and uh, talk about this uh, 10-week online class that I teach normally on Saturdays. Uh, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, where they did teach them in school. Uh, I'm going to teach a special session of it uh, today, as soon as I finish this broadcast. So we'll start uh, a little after 9.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, okay? Um, and one of the things, so you can still register for this online course. We have the information and thread of the broadcast. And we deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. One of the things we're going to talk about in class today is dealing with Hannibal Barca, uh, Hannibal of Carthage, and uh, the Punic Wars, uh, the, war, the, the Punic Wars between the uh, Carthaginians and the Romans, and uh, we'll get into uh, Publius Cornelius Scipio, uh, who took the surname Africanus. He took the surname Africanus after uh, the Battle of Zama in 202 BC. Okay, so we're going to deal with uh, a lot of that in today's class. I just want to do a brief overview, and I teach this class at our online school. It's now on Facebook or YouTube, but uh, I wanted to do a, a brief preview here. So when we deal with something interesting here, dealing with uh, Hannibal Barker, I'm about to bring up the slideshow presentation because uh, in the class uh, we do uh, a PowerPoint presentation, we have references, articles, video clips, all of this. Okay. And we do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch it anytime. All right, now, um, hold on, I'm gonna bring this up just a second here. Okay, there we go. Okay, so everybody share this broadcast on your social media platforms, invite your friends to tune in also. All right, so there was a, um, all of us have heard of Hannibal Barker, not Hannibal Lecter from Silence and the Lambs, not Hannibal, uh, George Bapard from the 18, but Hannibal Barker, okay, uh, the Carthaginian general who's one of the greatest military strategists uh, in history, if not the greatest military strategist in history. So there was a um, a series called Barbarians Rising, Barbarians Rising, uh, that came out from the History Channel uh, a few years ago. And Barbarians Rising deals with uh, 700 years of invasions, um, in, uh, invasions into the Roman Empire, okay? 700 years of uh, invasions of the Roman Empire and what leads to the Roman Empire falling and forced, in at least the Western portion of the Roman Empire falling in 476 AD when the Vandals and the Visigoths crushed the Western portion of the Roman Empire. So the um, this uh, Barbarians Rising came out in, in 2016, okay, and I watched it. It was it was very very good on the History Channel, and the first installment of Barbarians Rising uh, dealt with Hannibal Barca in the Battle of Cannae in 216 BC. Okay, now we know Hannibal Barca uh, lived from 247 BC to 183 BC, and we know that. Uh, uh, Carthage is going to be uh, destroyed uh, by the Romans. Uh, Carthage is destroyed by the Romans in uh, right around 146 uh, BCE, before the Common Era, 146 uh, BCE. If you watch the documentary, uh, A Great and Mighty Walk, uh, that deals with the life of Dr. John Henry Clark, um, that the Punic Wars are dealt with uh, there as well in the effort of the Romans to destroy Carthage, okay? But uh, in this series here, and uh, I wanna go back to the uh, PowerPoint presentation here. Um, in this series, the History Channel's documentary, Barbarians Rising, Barbarians Rising, uh, tackles the fall of Rome over the course of 700 years of invasions. However, the the most recent episode that aired Monday, now this is from, uh, this article is from June 2016, okay? The most recent episode that aired Monday depicts Hannibal Barker 
um, of Carthage as a black man, okay, which he was. He was he was Carthaginian. The Carthaginians are the descendants of the Phoenicians. Uh, he's of, he's of African descent, and the the uh, Carthaginians are the descendants of a larger group of Africans called the Garamantes. And, and the Garamantes are who the, the African Moors are descendants of. The, the African Moors coming from North Africa. We know they go into the Iberian Peninsula in 711 AD, uh, led by uh, General Tariq didn't see it. Uh, so the Moors that we talk about, they're descendants of the Garamantes as well. Okay, so um, the most re recent episode uh, depicts Hannibal Barca of Carthage as a black man, and many white history buffs, many white history buffs, are crying foul over the what they refer to as historical inaccuracy. But this is false. Hannibal was African, and so was his father. Uh, so were the people, generally speaking, of of Carthage. Now, Carthage is in uh, North Africa, the territory that's basically modern day Tunisia. That historically, generally speaking, was Carthage. We know that the geographical boundaries that exist today in Africa largely come from the Berlin Conference of 1884 and 1885. That's where those geographical boundaries come from. Those are not, generally speaking, the um, geographical boundaries that existed before the Berlin Conference, okay? Those uh, nine, about nine or so European nations carve up Africa into colonies and they draw the geographical boundaries around the areas that have the natural resources that these respective European nations want because they were fighting each other for hundreds of years, fighting and killing each other over the riches of Africa. And it gets to the point where they, they say, look, okay, Africa's large enough for us to carve it up in the colonies, and we don't have to keep killing each other over this. Okay, so this is the Berlin Conference of 1884 and 1885. Now, uh, Hannibal Barca ultimately wanted to invade Rome, but he failed to do so. So uh, in class, we're going to get deeper into uh, uh, Hannibal Barca. We'll talk some about the Punic Wars, things like this. Uh, we'll talk about Publius Cornelius uh, Scipio, uh, who took the surname of uh, Africanus. And contrary to popular belief, Africa is not named after a Roman general. Africa is not named after Publius Cornelius Scipio Africanus. That is blatantly false. And we'll deal with why also. I deal with this in the class also. We'll deal with why. This is why you have to understand language. And you have to do more research than just what's at the surface. Now, there have been debates over the race of Hannibal Barker. The debate still continues to this day. Now, it's not much of a debate. Proper documentation ends our conversation. It's not much of a debate. There was a good article from uh, AtlantaBlackStar.com from uh, June 7th, 2016. History Channel portrays Hannibal as black. White people cry foul over historical revisionism. Okay. Now, Carthage was one of the ancient African empires that Europeans tried to claim as their own. Carthage was one of those ancient African empires that Europeans tried to say was created by Europeans. No, it wasn't. These were Africans. These were black African people. All right. Now, in his book, World's Great Men of Color, Volume 1, uh, history scholar J.A. Rogers, Joel Augustus Rogers, J.A. Rogers asserts, quote, the Carthaginians were descendants of the Phoenicians, a Negroid people, and that in fact, until the rise of the doctrine of white superiority, Hannibal Barca was traditionally known as a black man. Hannibal Barca was traditionally known as a black man. So what happens is, is and we deal with this in the class, because we deal with about 50,000 years of history in this 10-week online course that I teach, H.E. Kemet, the Moors, and the Mahafa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they did teach in school. As Europeans are coming out of the Dark Ages, using the teachings that the African Moors take into Europe in 711 AD, as they come out of the Dark Ages in the 15th century, the 1400s, and, and they start conquering other people's land. You have Anton Gonzalez going to what today is present-day Mauritania in 1441, which basically starts the transatlantic slave trade. He picks up about 12 African people, takes them back to uh, Portugal, 
as you have ex, uh, explorations uh, by colonizers like Christopher Columbus, who is crucial to understanding the spread of the transatlantic slave trade and Columbus's four voyages starting August 3rd, 1492, when he sets sail on the Nina and the Penta and the Santa Maria, and he conquers the Bahamas and Hispaniola, the western third of the portion of Hispaniola is where we have the uh, of what we call Haiti, okay? Uh, and you have uh, Puerto Rico and, Pan and Panama and Honduras, and things like this, Jamaica, uh, which Columbus conquers in 1494. As Europeans are exploring, as they are conquering these new lands and setting up uh, plantations like sugarcane plantations, as they are exploiting the mineral wealth in these new lands and exploiting the uh, labor of indigenous people as well as African people, and there were African people already in these areas also. Uh, when you read uh, the first Americans were Africans documented evidence by Dr. David M. Hotel. He deals with this in his book. We deal with this book in, in the class, okay? Uh, it, 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 when we look at the African presence, going back at least 51,700 years ago, uh, we know that there were African people in North America, including the land we call the United States of America, at least 51,700 years ago. 700 years ago, specifically in the area that we call today South Carolina and Georgia, that area, these were the Khoisan. The Khoisan have the oldest DNA on the planet. They come from Southern Africa. And um, in this article here uh, from AtlantaBlackStar.com, five ethnic groups that prove the first humans were black. They cite the, the 2012 October uh, study from Science Magazine. Uh, that dealt that found that the Khoisan of Southern Africa are the oldest ethnic group of modern humans, with their ancestral line originating about 100,000 years ago. The Khoisan, formerly called by the derogatory term Bushmen, are genetically unique, and no other currently known population had separated so early from uh, our our common modern human ancestor, according to the report. Okay, so here are two uh, Khoisan uh, women, all right? All right, so in his book, World's Great Men of Color, J.A. Rogers, Joseph, Joel Augustus Rogers, and if you study um, Malcolm X, you know, that, you know that Malcolm X talks about J.A. Rogers and the teaching of uh, J.A. Rogers, okay? Um, The, the Carthaginians were descendants of the Phoenicians, a Negroid people, and that in fact, until the rise of the doctrine of white superiority, Hannibal Barker was traditionally known as a black man. Okay, so what happens, okay, Juanita says is better now. What happens is, as Europeans are coming out of the Dark Ages, conquering other people's land, extracting the mineral wealth out of, out of people's lands, um, traditional images that were African get reinterpreted as European. And this happens as you have a rise in the European powers, you have a rise in the dominance of the European phenotype, okay? As you have a rise in European powers, you have a rise in the dominance of European phenotypes. And this and, and this is what happens when you go from a, uh, a black Madonna and child, you go from that to uh, the decolorized version. To the white uh, Mary and Jesus, because Europeans were worshiping basically African people, and they were worshiping the Black Madonna and Child, which comes from Asar, Asar, Aset, and Heru, and, and uh, Aset being the the virgin who gives birth to the baby Heru on December twenty fifth of a virgin birth, and and they are known as the first Holy Trinity. This is in Europe, even before the Moors going in 711 AD, okay? And if you look at um, uh, Renoka Rashidi's book, uh, Black Star, the African Presence in Early Europe, okay? If you look at his book and pages um, 95, and I have his book somewhere, we've got the uh, Golden Age of the Moor here, edited by Dr. Ivan Van Sertima. That's one of the books I teach from in the class. You don't have to buy any of these books um, in the class to be able to follow along. But 
uh, and some of these we I show I can I scan some of the pages and show them to you. Uh, where is oh here it is right here. Another book we use in the class is Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization by Tony Browder. I finally got a, a brand new copy uh, back uh, was it May first, twenty twenty two, at the Hot Peak Conference, uh, the Palm One Conference here in Detroit. Uh, brother from brother from uh, my brother uh, brother Haki. Uh, but this this book right here, Black Star: The African Presence in Early Europe, by uh, Renoko Rashidi. We know Renoko passed away August second. 2021 he was a friend of mine he became an ancestor brilliant historian brilliant scholar uh archaeologist uh, anthropologist brother uh Renoko rashidi but uh, this book uh black star the african presence in early europe this deals with uh, a lot of the history of the moors in europe but page 90 and 91 he shows these are pictures he took himself uh most of these uh the, these are um statues of the black madonna and child in europe so we see page 90 uh madonna at uh Isaden, uh switzerland okay this one right here the black madonna and child statue here we see this painting our lady of jasna gora saskatchewan uh poland all right this one right here uh we look at this the black virgin virgin of madrid spain okay we see this statue here the Black Virgin and Child statue in St. John's Church, Luxembourg, City, Luxembourg. This one right here also. So when you study this history, you see that uh, Europeans were worshiping African people. And we see this in the worship of the Black Madonna and Child. Uh, you look at page 89, Black Madonna and Child painting, Kremlin, Moscow. This one right here. You look at uh, this picture here, uh, La, La Moraneta, Black Madonna and Child Statue, Statue uh, Montserrat, Spain. And we know it's gonna be Spain and Portugal, what was called the Iberian Peninsula, that the Moors first go into in 711 AD because that's right above Morocco, okay? And so this is where they're going to go into. Um, if we go back here to the presentation, how's everybody doing? Hopefully I'm coming through okay. Hopefully you can see and hear me okay. And this is just a brief overview of this 10 week online class that I teach. I'm gonna teach a, another session of the class as soon as I finish this broadcast. We have the information here in the thread of the broadcast here. You can register for this 10 week online course, Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school. So, as Europeans are coming out of the Dark Ages in the 14th, in the 1400s, the 15th century, as they start to conquer people's land and extract the mineral wealth and build Europe back up, keep in mind, Europe had lost between one quarter to one third of their population because of the Black Death, okay, the bubonic plague, which hits in spurts from 1347 to 1400. And uh, as Dr. John Henry Clark talks about, Europe was land poor, people poor, and resource poor. Okay, so when you look at, for instance, uh, Hercules, okay, Hercules was originally depicted as an African. Hercules is then going to be reinterpreted as a European. When we look at uh, Michelangelo painting the Sistine Chapel, okay, not the Sixteenth Chapel, the Sistine Chapel, okay, he uses the uh, images of his aunt and uncle for Adam and Eve. And he uses, uh, and then he depicts God as being a European and the angels being a European. So power is the ability to define and shape reality and have other people accept your definition of reality as if it were their own. So as Europeans conquer people's land, build them, build, build up, uh, rebuild Europe, and you start having this rise in the European, the rise in the dominance of the European phenotype, they reinterpret a lot of these previous images and then project that to the world and use their, their military force to enforce this, as well as 
uh, the image of Yeshua or what the English call Jesus, because the letter J didn't exist until 1630 AD. The letter J coming from uh, the letter I, okay, that didn't exist until uh, 1630 AD. So this is why it's important to uh, uh, understand this chronology of history and understand what happened. So this is these are just some of the things that we deal with in this um, uh, 10 week online class that I teach. And we're actually gonna have um, uh, probably do about 12 sessions this time around, okay? And if we look at this very quickly here from history.com, um, this one deals with seven things about the Sistine Chapel that you didn't know, okay? Who still needs uh, to register for this 10 week online class? Because I'm gonna teach uh, another session. I'm gonna teach another session uh, today as soon as I finish this broadcast, okay? Um, today is Monday, July 12th. So we're going to, uh, I'll be here for a few more minutes. Then we're going to teach a session of this at my online school. So who needs me to, uh, who still needs to register for this 10 week online class? Seven things you may not know about the Sistine Chapel. Check out seven surprising facts about the famous ceiling and the artist who painted it, okay? So, uh, 15, in 1508, 33 year old Michelangelo was hard at work on Pope Julius II's marble tomb, a relatively obscure piece now uh, located in Rome's uh, San Pietro in, uh, Vincoli, uh, in Vincoli Church. When Pope Julius II asked uh, the esteemed artist to switch gears and decorate the Sistine, S I S T I N E, not 16, the Sistine, Sistine Chapel ceiling, Michelangelo bought. For one thing, he considered himself a sculptor rather than the painter, and he had no experience whatsoever with frescoes, okay? Now, if we go look uh, to contemporary, contrary to popular belief, Michelangelo painted the Sistine Chapel in a standing position. Uh, three, uh, working on the Sistine Chapel was so unpleasant that Michelangelo wrote a poem about his misery. Uh, so in, he, does, he does this in 1509. Uh, number four, Michael, let's see. Uh, uh, okay, three, working on the Sistine Chapel was so unpleasant that Michelangelo wrote, wrote a poem about his misery. Okay, then uh, number four, Michelangelo's masterpiece has proven highly resilient. Uh, Number five, Michelangelo Sistine Chapel. Okay, so then the Sistine Chapel ceiling's most famous panel might depict the human brain. Okay, they talk about that. In the section entitled The Creation of Adam, figures representing God and Adam reach for each other with, with their arms outstretched. Uh, their almost touching fingers are one of the world's most recognizable and widely replicated images. Some theorists think the scene also contains the unmistakable outline of a human brain, B-R-A-I-N, uh, formed by the angels and robes surrounding God. According to uh, Franklin uh, Meshberger, a uh, doctor who pioneered this hypothesis, Michelangelo meant to evoke, evoke God's bestowal of intelligence on the first human. Uh, okay, now popes, number seven, now popes are elected, elected in the Sistine Chapel. All right, now, when you, um, so what happens is, so you, you're looking at the, the 16th century, uh, right about 1508, about 1508, Michelangelo uh, uh, starts the, uh, uh, to paint the Sistine Chapel, okay? And there was another piece on this that um, had uh, some good facts on this also. I'm gonna try to pull this up. Okay, uh, this day in history, November 1st, uh, 1512, Sistine Chapel opens to public. Sistine Chapel opens to public. Think of the Sistine Chapel in Rome, one of, the, uh, one of Italian artists Michelangelo's finest works is exhibited to the public for the first time on November 1st, 1512. Michelangelo uh, Barnati, the greatest of the 
Italian Renaissance artist, was born in a small village of Caprice in 1475. Uh, skip over all that. Now, he was called, called to Rome in 1508 to paint the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, the, the chief consecrated space in the Vatican. Michelangelo's epic ceiling frescoes, which took several years to complete, are among his most memorable works central in a complex system of decoration featuring numerous figures uh, uh featuring numerous figures are nine panels devoted to biblical world history okay now what i say may go outside the circumference of some people's awareness okay what i say may go outside the circumference of some people's awareness um but just because you disagree with what I say does not mean that what I'm saying is not true. It just means you have to do some more research to understand what I'm talking about. Okay. World history is in world history books. Religious literature is in religious literature. When you talk about biblical world history, that's a contradiction. If you understand world history, you know what I'm talking about. When you talk about biblical world history, world history is in world history books. Religious literature is in religious literature. Have you ever been to historical museums that like deal with like world history? Not just not not like an American history museum that just deals with American history, but like world history museums. Okay. You ever wonder why you don't see biblical characters in world history museums? You ever wonder why you don't see biblical characters in world history museums? Because world history is an account of what happened. World history is in world history books. Religious literature is in religious literature books. If you mix world history with religious literature, you're going to be very, very confused. And world history is also backed up by archaeological evidence, things like this. Okay. So when, when they say something like, Biblical world history, that's a contradiction. If you understand world history, you, you know what I'm talking about. Now, the most famous of these is the creation of Adam, a painting in which the arms of God and Adam are stretching toward each other. In 1512, Michelangelo completed the work. After 15 years as an architect in Florence, Michelangelo returned uh, to Rome in 1534, where he will work and live for the rest of his life. Uh, okay, blah blah blah. All right, uh, but what, what you have here is you you have Rome, a dominant power. They're out of the Dark Ages. Okay, Romans in Italy. They're out of the Dark Ages. They're conquering people's land. You you have them reinterpreting these images because previously they were worshiping the Black Madonna in China. Now they 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 repaint they they redepict all that stuff as being European, and then they spread that across the world because they're rising in power. As you have a rise in European and Europeans coming out of the Dark Ages, conquering people's land, extracting the mineral wealth, subjugating people. As you have a rise in the European powers of these European nations, you have a rise in the dominance of the European phenotype. And as Dr. John Henry Clark talks about, Europeans colonize not just the minds of non-European people, but also the images that are projected to the world. And he said the most powerful image that they colonized was the image of God. And when you worship a God that does not look like you and you worship a savior that does not that does not look like you, then what you do is become the spiritual prisoners of those people whose depiction of God looks like that you worship. And it's like you're putting your faith into their hands and those people on earth who look like the image of God or who are the uh, ethnicity or the race of the same uh, God of your imagination, the, the, the same image of God that you have implanted in your mind, those people on earth that look like that 
also subconsciously, tacitly become the gods in real life on that planet. They become the representations. They become the physical representations of those of those gods that you worship. When you worship people that don't look like you. And this is where we see this get twisted around. When, when Europeans are coming out of the dark ages, we see this get twisted around. And then we, we see the transatlantic slave trade begin in the mid 15th century, 1441. And we, we see prior to this, we're going to see the subjugation of the African known as the Moors that are going to start. And this continues the, 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 the conflict between uh, the African Moors and Europeans that we see start in Europe. That's going to continue with the transatlantic slave trade. One of the biggest mistakes that is made when we deal with this history, and that when I was taking my Africana studies classes at uh, Wayne State University in like 1994, 1995 here in Detroit, when we started the history of the transatlantic slave trade, they started in the mid 15th century. They didn't deal with the Africans known as the Moors going into the Iberian Peninsula in 711 AD. Okay. They didn't deal with thousands of years of African history prior to that. And, and the Moors are take, take, taking the teachings from ancient Africa, from the Nile Valley region of Africa, into Europe. And these teachings bring Europe, the Europeans out of the Dark Ages. It's going to be to our detriment because everything we taught Europeans came to kick us in the behind. Everything, everything we taught them, <coughs> everything we taught Europeans came to kick us in the behind. Okay, so if you start studying transatlantic slave trade in the 15th century, you, you're not going to understand. The transatlantic slave trade is a continuation of the wars that were taking place and the conflicts that were taking place between the African Moors and Europeans. And then we're going to see that when uh, the, the, uh, uh, the Moors lose control in uh, Granada, January 2nd, 1492, Boabdil surrenders. Uh, we see Columbus setting sail August 3rd, 1492. We're going to see some of the Moors flee. Some of the Moors are going to flee Spain. Others are going to be conquered and enslaved. And you, you're going to see uh, some some of these Africans taken into these colonies that the Spanish set up. One of the mistakes that's made is thinking that when the transatlantic slave trade happens, this is the first time that Europeans, the Portuguese, the Spanish, the Germans, later the English, when they get involved in uh, 1562, uh, with uh, John Hawkins, Sir John Hawkins, the Dutch, things like this. The mistake that's made is thinking this is the first time they came in contact with African people. No, they've been dealing with them for hundreds of years, at least. There were African people in Europe even before the Moors go in. But let's just look at that period of time from 711 AD to 1492. They were dealing with Africans for hundreds of years. They knew who they were. They knew where they came from. They knew what the Moors brought into Europe. They, they, they brought the they brought the science they brought the periodic tables they brought something called alchemy which today we call chemistry they brought the chemistry they brought the algebra uh they brought alcohol al al that arabic prefix which means of the they brought uh different types of foods different types of oranges they brought different types of musical instruments they were creating uh treaties to uh create um uh, surgical instruments, surgical instruments to do surgery. They were teaching Europeans how to do surgery at different parts of the body. They were uh, creating standards for physicians. Of, they created standardized tests for physicians to have to pass. This is what the Moors are introducing in Europe. They're building libraries, all this stuff. They're, and they were also intermixing into the European population. Okay. And changing the complexion to various degrees, to varying degrees of Europeans. But this is also how you get 
uh, the African Moors heads, the African heads on these national flags of Corsica and Sardinia. Okay, Sardinia is is a uh, Italian island in the Mediterranean. They have four African Moors heads on their national flags, and Corsica is a uh, uh, French island in the Mediterranean, and they have an African Moors head on it also. And you, if you if you look at the Moors head with the bandana and the hoop earring, now originally that was originally instead of a bandana. It was a blindfold to signify that these Africans had been conquered and they were prisoners. And if you go to Sardinia's official website and you search on it and you go look at, you go look, they have another version of the flag on their website. Uh, it's Sardinia Turismo. And I we, we go through deep into this in, in the 10 week online class. They show a version of this flag where the headband is a blindfold to show that these African Moors were conquered and were prisoners because that's what the original flag was. But because of tourism and to be politically correct and things like this, they turned the blindfold into a headband. But all this is connected to history. This is also connected to the history of the transatlantic slave trade. The transatlantic slave trade does not just fall out of the sky. It's not something that just, just happens. That is the culmination of, of hundreds of years of history and the culmination of these of these conflicts between these Europe, these Africans and Europeans that continue. It's really Europeans getting revenge on these African Moors. OK, and it, because there's hostility that that builds up against the Moors because of how powerful they become, wealthy they become in Europe, things like this, but also intermixing into the European population and changing the complexion of Europeans to varying degrees, especially in Spain and Portugal. The, and the complexion of Europeans in Spain and Portugal traditionally was darker than those in England because there was a greater influx of the African Moors going into Spain and Portugal because the Iberian Peninsula is right above Morocco. England, even though it was impacted by that intermixing, it was to a lesser extent. We're going to see this intermixing in Austria and Germany. We see the, the African presence in Austria and Germany as well. Okay. But it's not going to be as much as we see like in Italy, Sicily, Spain, Portugal, et cetera, because those are closer to uh, North Africa and closer to Morocco. Now, uh, so this is why under, the, the way I deal with the transatlantic slave trade, the way I teach it is different than some traditional ways because the, the the history that i studied goes long before the transatlantic slave trade so you have to deal with a chronology of this history okay now uh we talked about hannibal barker i'm gonna wrap this up in a few minutes who still needs to register for this 10-week online class i'm gonna post the, we have the link to the fair of the book we have the link uh to register for the class here in the fair of this broadcast also is on our uh, website uh, the our new website the African History Network dot com uh, the African History Network dot com okay classes on sale sixty dollars regularly one hundred and fifty dollars oh sorry regularly one hundred thirty dollars also sixty dollars we have a bundle pack where you can register for both classes for uh, hundred dollars okay so uh, uh, really about three hundred sixty dollar value because there's some bonus classes there's some bonus lectures you can get from you also in digital format uh if we look at this here quickly and uh, uh you can go to our website theafricanhistorynetwork.com we have the information right on the home page uh this is our new website that i spent time building and i'm uh adding to it also but if you just scroll down information about our radio show sundays 9 p.m 11 p.m eastern standard time the african history network show and then uh, we have a bundle pack here. You can register for both classes for hundred dollars. Click right here, register here. Well, you got the information here for the classes. Okay. All right. Now, um, Publius Cornelius Scipio, Africanus. As soon as I finish this broadcast, we're going to teach the uh, online class today, so you can join this uh, 
live in the class here in a few minutes. Uh, it's been a busy day. I wanted to teach it earlier, but it just didn't work out. It's been a busy day today. For Blaise Cornelius Scipio Africanus, a lot of people still mistakenly think that Africa was named after uh, a Roman general named Blaise Cornelius Scipio Africanus. That's false. There's a few reasons why it's false. Number one, his last name, his surname, his last name, his family's last name was not Africanus, it was Scipio. Okay. Um, he lived from 236 BC before the Common Era to 183 BC. <coughs> 246 to 183 BC. All right. Now, the word Africanus in uh, the word Africanus is Latin. Okay. And if you look at the Sales Latin English Dictionary, uh, this is the 2002 edition. Cassell's Latin English Dictionary. Page 11 in the entry for a fear, A-F-E-R. And J.A. Rogers talks about a fear as well. Um, it says Africanus belonging to Africa. The word Africanus means belonging to Africa. But if we look here at the last paragraph, um, this is page 14 of African People in World History by Dr. John Henry Clark. If we look at uh, the last paragraph, after the rise and decline of Greek civilization and the Roman destruction of the city of Carthage, the Romans organized the conquered territory territories, the Romans organized the conquered territories into a province they called Africa, into a province they called Africa. Uh, a word derived from the word afri, A-F-R-I, a word derived from the word, uh, word derived. derived from the word afri, A-F-R-I. Okay, now the uh, a free, the name of free was a name of a group of people about whom little is known. This was a very new name because previously all uh, dark skinned people were called Ethiopians. Previously, all dark skinned people were called Ethiopians. Since the Greeks referred to Africa as Ethiopia, the land of the bird faced people. And when you study Greek mythology, and I took a, a, a Greek mythology uh, class in high school in uh, 11th grade, when you study Greek mythology, they tell you that Zeus, who's the king of the gods in uh, amongst the Greeks, they tell you Zeus originally came from Ethiopia. Originally, Zeus was depicted as an Ethiopian. He was depicted as an African, but then he gets changed as you as you come out of the dark ages and Europeans are reinterpreting these various images, he gets reinterpreted as a European, just like Hercules got reinterpreted as a European. OK, I'm going to post the information here. You can register for uh, this uh, 10 week online class that I teach. And we're going to have more than 10 sessions this time around. We'll have 12 because uh, as soon as I finish this broadcast, we're going to teach, uh, I'm going to teach another uh, another section of this class at our online school, so you can join us tonight for uh, this class. Okay, let's go back to uh, the PowerPoint presentation, I mean, uh, to the slide here. After 300 AD, new states, new states, and eventually empires began to appear in inner West Africa, which the Arabs later called the Western Sudan. The best known of these states were Ghana, Mali, and Shanghai. Their collective uh, life, their collective lifespan was more than a thousand years, but these West African empires were in decline on the eve of the transatlantic slave trade. Okay. So this this is just um, a brief overview of some of the things that we do within the class. But we're going to talk about Hannibal Barca uh, in today's uh, class. 
we're going to talk about the Punic Wars, the Carthaginians, things like this. Okay, we deal with all this in the class, and I talked about uh, uh, Carthage. We'll deal with Carthage, things like this. So we, we go through and look at history chronologically, um, and we deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. Okay, we also look at things like why is Christmas celebrated on December 25th when nowhere in the biblical text does it state that Jesus the Christ or Yeshua, because the letter J wasn't created till 1630 AD. Uh, Yeshua, um, nowhere in the biblical text does it state that Jesus the Christ or Yeshua was born on December 25th. Okay. So we, we've gone through and looked at some of the things that we do within the class and we'll talk about Hannibal Barca. We'll talk about the Moors. Kemet is one of the original names for Egypt, okay? Kemet is one of the original names for Egypt. Normally, I teach this class on Saturdays, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We have the information at our new website, uh, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. We're going to do a special session uh, today. Now, some of the things we do within the class, first of all, we can't start studying our history in slavery even when we study the transatlantic slave trade which is important to study, we can't start in 1619 or in the 1440s with the Portuguese, when the Portuguese get involved in 1441, when uh, Anton Gonzalez goes into uh, the territory that's present day um, Mauritania, okay, and picks up about 12 Africans and takes them back to uh, Portugal, okay. We, we have to deal with hundreds of years of history that leads up to uh, the transatlantic slave trade taking place. Okay. We have to deal with hundreds of years of history that leads up to uh, the transatlantic slave trade taking place. And we have to deal with this history uh, chronologically. Okay. So this is what we deal with in the class. And we do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. So you can go back and watch them anytime. So as soon as you register, you can go and watch the previous classes. So you can join us uh, in today's class. Now we have to understand the history chronologically and deal with the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors who enter into the Iberian Peninsula today known as Spain and Portugal from North Africa in 711 AD. Okay. And they're led by uh, Tariq Ibn Ziyad. Okay. Uh, the the, the um, African uh, general. And they're going to take the teachings from the Nile Valley region of Africa into Europe. And it's going to be these teachings that uh, will bring Europe out of the dark ages. And Europe is cast into the dark ages when um, the uh, Western portion of the Roman empire is crushed by the Vandals and the Visigoths in uh, 476 AD, 476 AD, okay? All right, and let me post this information here. Okay, so give us a thumbs up, give us a like, give us a heart on this broadcast, um, and you're gonna learn a lot in this class. I do a PowerPoint presentation, we have book references, articles, video clips, a uh, ton of information in the class. You can also use this information with your children. I would say the content is PG-13, okay, you know, and um, we have, a bunch so it's not i don't do a lot of cursing things like that overly vulgar or overly graphic you know etc and we also have a bundle pack where you can register for uh uh both classes that i teach uh, for a hundred dollars uh, it's a uh 260 dollar value that's discounted to a hundred dollars right now and there's some extra uh, uh lectures you're going to get from me uh included as well all right. Yeah, this is an online school because this is a preview of the online of an online course that I teach at our online school, the African History Network School. OK, so this course not only deals with the transatlantic slave trade, but thousands of years of history that leads up to the transatlantic slave trade of African people taking place. We hear a lot about 1619 and we know that August 20th, 1619 marked the 400th year anniversary of those 20 and odd Africans coming into Point Comfort in uh, Virginia, the colony of Virginia. But African people were here in this land 
that we call the United States of America thousands of years before that. And we know Native Americans call this land Turtle Island, as Dr. David M. Hotep deals with in his book of the first Americans were Africans documented evidence. This book right here that we reference in the class also. The first Americans were Africans documented evidence by Dr. David M. Hotel. All right, now, uh, the year 2019 was known as the year of return as many African Americans were reconnecting to Africa and, and continue to do this and travel to Ghana and other West African countries. When we, when we discuss the transatlantic slave trade, we have to first understand that African people are the original people of North, Central, and South America and have been in the land we call the U.S. at least 51,700 years ago. These were the Khoisan, as we previously talked about, who come from Southern Africa and have the oldest DNA on the planet. So some of the things we deal with in the class, the 800-year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors, shocking archaeological discoveries that are causing experts to rethink everything. And we deal with a number of different archaeological discoveries that cause uh, people to uh, push the timelines back, that cause people to push the timelines back. Uh, shocking archaeological discoveries that are causing experts to rethink everything. Insurance companies that took out insurance policies on slave ships and enslaved Africans on plantations. Freemasonry, America and the Founding Fathers the origins of the term, uh, terms America, Africa, and more, okay? Uh, so this is just, just a few of the things that we deal with in the class. We go through and look at this history in different periods of time, chronologically as much as possible. Of course, you deal with Christopher Columbus um, and the role Columbus plays in the spreading of the transatlantic slave trade. He helps lay the foundation for slavery, racism, capitalism, and the exploitation of indigenous people. Um, and we look at what were some of the events that lead up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place also. We deal with Asar Aset and Heru and the origins of the Immaculate Conception story, links to ancient Kit, Kemet, Egypt, and early Christianity, um, Freemasonry in America, and the fake Willie Lynch letter 1712. These are just a few of the things that we deal with in this uh, 10 week online class that I teach ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, where they didn't teach you in school. So we have the information at our uh, new website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. How you all like this type of information also? Let me know. Give us a thumbs up. Give us a heart. Give us a like. Post here on the thread of broadcast. How you like this type of information? Uh, we have a, a bundle pack because the uh, normally I teach this class on Saturdays, but I was tied up Saturday. So we're teaching it uh, today when I finish this broadcast. On Sundays, um, the second class that I teach is from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. The second class picks up where the first one leaves off. The second class uh, will do a special session of this on Wednesday, uh, July 13, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And the second class we uh, pick up in 1803 with the Louisiana Purchase and the Haitian Revolution, the Louisiana Purchase and the Haitian Revolution, okay, because those two incidences are related. And then uh, we go through our history and we look at what leads to the Civil War taking place. We look at the, uh, uh, the Civil War, Reconstruction, Jim Crow era. World War One, World War Two, Great Migration, 1915, 1970, six million African Americans migrating from the south, up north, and out west. We look at World War One, World War Two, Civil Rights Movement, Black Power Movement. To understand how we got to where we are today and understand what needs to take place to and for us to understand where we need to go from here. You have to understand the history and the laws and policies that put us in the predicament we're in today so we understand where we need to go from here. So that's what we look at in that second class, okay? And I'll, I'll post a link here uh, for the uh, two course bundle pack. As soon as you register, uh, you can watch, uh, you can start watching the content. We have bonus content. You can watch the previous classes and you can join us in class live. So we do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch the classes anytime. So a year from now, two years from now, you can go back and watch the entire class and um, 
You can also support the African History Network, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, paypal.me uh, forward slash the AHN show, okay? Um, and we have that information on the homepage of our website also. So there's some fake African History Network Cash App accounts out there that have been st that have been stealing money from us this is our only cash app account dollar sign the ahn show s-h-o-w dollar sign the ahn show s-h-o-w when you go to it it says michael and shows my picture there these other ones here and there are a few few more that i've i have identified these other ones are fake african history network cash app accounts their tag is a variation of ours but these are fake this, this is our only cash app account like i said when you go to it it says michael it shows my picture there okay uh i've opened up a investigation with cash app they're slower than heinz ketchup i've opened up an investigation with cash app and let them know there's fake accounts out there uh so they're uh investigating this all right okay so you can register for the class uh, i've got to get out of here i'm about to teach this uh, class you can join us in the class live uh, once you register. If you missed the live class, once we do it as archived, you can go back and watch it anytime. Okay. So hopefully you learned a lot here. Uh, also, we have a, um, a pro special promotion going on at our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. Get 30% off on orders of $100 or more DVD lectures and digital downloads and my lectures and some others. Uh, use is, is for a very limited time only. Use coupon code AHN30 off July. AHN30 off July. We have the information at our website, uh, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. All right, we have to get out of here. Remember, at the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. Because right now, it's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. And uh, we'll see.